place and he actually has has it set up. It's probably the size of a refrigerator and everything that goes on. I won't pretend to understand how it works or how he did it, but he did it and it works and you can actually see what he does. The, uh, the second time that I met up with Ben was when I visited his place and he did something that is equally awesome. He learned how to make astronaut ice cream at home. How many of you know what astronaut ice cream is? A lot of you, yeah. It's that freeze-dried ice cream that's got a really great, crunchy, very lightweight flavor. And he made authentic Neapolitan astronaut ice cream. And to do that, he had to uh, take ice cream, keep it at a very low temperature, and then suck all the air out of it for the freeze-drying method. So he modified a, uh, a pump to remove all the as much air as possible and let the uh, the ice cream dehydrate in a in a vacuum. And once he was done with that, it was indistinguishable from the, the kind you would buy in the store. It was really fantastic. And uh, you've got uh, another food project here today. I do. Yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead? And, what, what, you probably have a few slides. I'll let you just go ahead and start talking about. Cool. What you I brought a bunch of photos, and so I wasn't sure how that was going to play in with the interview. That let's, let's start. Why don't you just start showing your photos, and we can we can talk a little bit about okay. it. Yeah. So Mark mentioned uh, freeze drying stuff. I also made some aerogel. I don't know if you've heard about what aerogel is. Aerogel is a really, really lightweight solid. In fact, it's the lightest weight solid that we've ever invented. It's used to insulate the space shuttle. That's what's used in the, in the tiles on the front of the space shuttle. And typically it's made in expensive research labs, but one of my favorite things to do is to do expensive research lab projects at home. So this is me, my, my, the picture shows me holding a picture of uh, aerogel that I made myself. Um, the toughest part in making this is actually getting the chemicals, unfortunately. So doing the process is not so bad, but actually getting the chemicals from the chemical supply house is the most difficult part of the whole project. So did you have to kind of fudge a little bit to get the stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, the aerogel, I saw chunks of it. It's really cool because you're, it looks like you're looking at a, a piece of fog or something that doesn't dissipate. Yeah, exactly. It's called like liquid smoke. Like It's so lightweight, you can't really feel it in your hand, but it's strong enough to support like a brick, like you can put something heavy on top of it. It's pretty amazing. Why is it that the raw chemicals are, are uh, reg regulated? You know, they aren't even that dangerous. I mean, in all honesty, there's chemicals that are a lot more hazardous, but for some reason, it's selling chemicals to individuals, especially in this country, is like completely off the table. Yeah, I'm sure there are like solvents you could get at a hardware store that are far more dangerous yeah, absolutely. Than, than that stuff. Yeah. So now we're looking at something that I talked about, um, your astronaut ice cream. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the process of discovery uh, you, you looked at the patents and then you had to like modify some equipment to, to make it a success. It's true, actually patents are a really good source of information about a process. So if you think you want to learn something about, let's say, uh, freeze-drying ice cream, you can search through the patents and actually gain a lot of knowledge about the process in general. Oftentimes the patents are expired or whatever, but you can still search them in Google Patents and get a lot of information that way. That's cool. Um, the, the pump, when you showed me the pump, it had a very large diameter uh, hose coming out of the, uh, the flask, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, it's, um, at really low pressures, so what you want to do with freeze-drying is extract the water out of the thing that you're drying. And uh, through a really narrow hose, the water molecules aren't very inclined to go through there. So at really low pressures, water molecules don't behave kind of like flowing it through a garden hose. They actually kind of bounce around through the hose and by random chance make it out the other end. So if you've got a really long, narrow hose, all those little molecules are going to be bouncing around and not very many of them are going to get through. If you've got a really big pipe, then a lot of molecules bounce through there and get through. That's cool. Um, let's see. Let's see next so this was a project that I built last fall. Well, actually, I didn't build this. This is a frozen chicken wearing a sweatshirt. But um, what I built is an airport TSA scanner. So if you go through the airport, this is actually changing right now, but up until about a month or two ago, if you went to the San Jose airport, you would get a backscatter x-ray scan of your body. And the machine sends x-rays out toward you, and it measures how many how the x-rays reflect off of your body. So if you're, if you're hiding a piece of metal under your shirt, the x-rays are absorbed by the metal and they don't reflect. But it does reflect off of things like flesh and water and things like that. 
So I took an x-ray image of that chicken, and it's a little hard to see. This is the leg of the chicken. This is the other leg, and this is kind of the where the head would be. And I've hit a little crooked piece of metal under its sweater. That's amazing. So you made your own backscatter x-ray. Uh, yeah. And why, why has the airport stopped using it? Um, that's an interesting question. I think um, RapidScan was unable to prove that it was safe enough or something like that. I really don't know the details there. So what is the machine now that you're standing in that you go like this? It's not x-ray? That is a millimeter wave detector. And so that one actually uses radio frequency. Okay. So is it safer than x-ray? In theory, it doesn't emit any ionizing radiation. So you could stand in there all day long pretty much if you want. But this is coming from a company that couldn't guarantee that their x-ray machines are safe, so, you know. Yeah, what do we have here? That's, that's the actual back, backscatter detector. Okay. So it has a spinning disc, and it shoots the x-rays out, kind of like a lighthouse. So it's kind of got this little pencil beam of x-rays coming out. And then when you put the chicken in front of it, the pencil beam of x-rays scans across the chicken. And that's why the image looks kind of, like you can see some horizontal yeah. banding, which is each scan line. What kind of precautions did you take to protect yourself from x-rays? What? what? <laughs> <laughs> did you not wear like a, a lead suit of armor? Lead apron or something? Yeah. Um, the trick is that the exposure levels, if you're not in the beam's path, are very, very low. So you would be getting about the same exposure that a TSA worker would get standing outside the backscatter machine. And so you're basically getting the backscatter of the backscatter, which is a very, very small. Did you take measurements to make sure there was no leakage? Uh, I did, sort of. I, I had a Geiger counter that would let me know if I was actually getting ionizing radiation. Okay. I actually used Jeff Kaiser's Geiger counter kit. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very cool. That's a beer brewing apparatus. Uh-huh. And. Uh, what, is it like a you, you pour your your uh, wort in there and it makes beer? Exactly. So this is a one tank solution. You saw Peter Beast's excellent talk on beer brewing yesterday and today. This is a system that puts it all into one tank. So it's not as good for really high quality brewing, but it saves a little bit of time since you only have one tank. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Do you ever think of like? making commercial versions of this stuff? This particularly would yeah. lend itself to that. Yeah, actually, so they, they, you can buy something sort of like this commercially. It isn't really a one-tank solution, but it's, it kind of looks like that. It's really just doing the job of fermentation. Um, but when I make stuff at home, I actually really enjoy not doing commercial things. In fact, even choosing things that cannot be commercialized, like the cookie machine that I brought. That's great. Yeah, we'll talk about, hopefully you'll have pictures of the uh, Unfortunately, no pictures. It's too okay. recent to even have pictures. Okay. Well, we can go on. Do you have any more photos? Here? I can keep going, yeah. Okay, sure. You can let me know when we have enough here. This looks like a, a controlled substance. Um, I don't think it's controlled. That's pure caffeine that I extracted from coffee. Wow. How did you do that? I had two methods. I had the supercritical CO2 method, and then I also had the uh, methylene chloride method. Mm -hmm. And how much, uh, so what are we looking at, like a, a, a few grams here? Yeah, that ended up being about half a gram maybe. That was, a much, that was about a cup worth of coffee beans, I think. Okay. So 10 or 20 cups of coffee maybe. Uh -huh. And it, it looks, it looks like, uh, I mean, it's, it's so pure looking. How did you extract that out of the cap bean and leave all the, yeah. did you use green capped coffee beans? Yeah, so I tried it a couple different ways. Um, the trick with making it really pure is to uh, purify it through a process of sublimation. So if you put the, the dirty caffeine in a beaker and then put the beaker on a hot plate and then put some really cold, a cold glass surface on the top of the caffeine actually sublimates off the heat part and condenses on the on the cold part. Uh -huh. And then you have really pure caffeine up on the cold part. And then you just scrape it off. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. That's amazing. Did you uh, did you stir it up in a glass of water and drink it? Just have a <laughs> demonstration purposes. <laughs> yeah. This is a cat feeder that I made. And uh, does it, uh, it dispenses cat food, I can see a little thing there. Is it hooked to a timer circuit? Yep, exactly. That's great, and the cat, I remember your cat. Thank yeah. Your cat, she looks well fed. So I used a similar technique for the cookie machine that had to dispense like chocolate chips. It's kind of the same as cat food. So I used actually the same sort of dispensing device. That's great, very cool. And so you use that when you're out of town? Yep. It really works. Oh yeah, it's been running for about a year now. That's so cool. That's great because you, you're, you're, uh, 
day job is that you worked in Seattle in the uh, top secret hardware lab of Valve Software. Becoming less secret, but yes, it started off totally secret. Yeah, that's cool. Has it has anything come out of the lab that you can talk about? Um, yeah, so the, the rumors of the Steam Box have kind of gotten more and more public. Uh -huh. I think I got burned the last time I tried to talk about it public, so, you know, I gotta, okay. gotta be careful now, but if you want to search for rumors, go ahead on the internet. Search for Steam Box. That sounds cool. Are you, uh, how many of you are familiar with Steam, the, uh, the game application the software? Yeah, there you go. Steam Box, I'm excited. That sounds great. Any more photos? Sure. You've got so many things going on. Here's a... So, in keeping with the x-ray theme, I, I decided I'd also build a CT scanner. So, this is shooting x-rays through a chicken, the same frozen chicken. And what it's done is it's taken a picture about every 8 degrees. So, it spins the chicken around and takes an uh, x-ray photo every 8 degrees. That's amazing. And then through computer tomography, you can convert this into a 3D volume. So you actually have like a depth, like you can slice through the chicken and get like a sort of a medical looking skin. Cool. Yeah, it's like a, a CAT scan. Exactly. That's great. Uh, this is a table that I brought to Baker Fair about three or four years ago. And what's in it? It's filled with fluid. And so when you spin the disc around, uh, it makes all these swirly kind of fluid patterns in there. Yeah, it's beautiful. I remember when you brought that. There's the picture of the There's the pictures of it. Yeah, it reminds me a little of, of uh, etch a sketch, but it's not as yeah, a different kind it's, of. Uh, it's filled with something called rayoscopic fluid that you can buy online. It's the same stuff they put in shampoo, opalescent sort of oh, stuff. Or yeah, I can see that. There's a chicken again there. Oh, this is what a chip looks like. So if you take like a regular IC, like uh -huh. a. Yeah. Some more x-ray stuff right there. One of those, like a standard looking chip, you can add some acid to the top and the acid will actually eat through the plastic case of the chip, but leave the silicone dye exposed. Oh, that's great. So, so what we're looking at, that little tiny square there is actually the only active ingredient in a chip. You right. can see the wires coming up. Everything else is just uh, yeah. like the packaging yep. material. And so you're used to like normal CPUs are actually really big. So if you've ever taken apart like a Pentium, it's, it's chip is like, you know, almost a centimeter on a side. But most like cheap logic chips that you find in like average electronics are super tiny, like wow. two millimeters on a side maybe. That's a great, what kind of acid do you use to do that? Uh, fuming nitric acid. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no, it's, like, it's hard to get, you know? <laughs> you have to be kind of sneaky about that too. <laughs> and how come it didn't eat away the wires? These are gold bond wires. And so when they're putting the chip together, they're actually gold for the reason that they don't want them to corrode. They have to be very high conductivity and it has to make a good contact with the chip. So the gold will resist the fuming nitric acid for, for a short time. Gold resists quite a few things. It's, I think aqua regia. Yes, exactly. Yep. It doesn't hold up to that, but most everything else. Yeah, exactly. That's really cool. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit about your, your cookie project and then people can, after this, can go take a look at it. Sure. So for this year, I brought a machine that makes uh, one cookie at a time. So it has all the ingredients for a chocolate chip cookie, and all the ingredients are dispensed into a mixing cup, and then you take the mixing cup and put your blob of cookie dough onto a sheet. So what this lets you do is make a different recipe for each one of the cookies on the sheet, so you can experiment cookie by cookie, and you don't have to commit yourself to a whole batch. So a lot of people have a problem, well, what if I added more salt to my cookies? Does it really make it taste better, or is it just extra sodium? Now you can actually step it up 10% at a time and figure out exactly where the balance is. That's cool, you can optimize it, I bet. Yeah. Like, makers have found like using things like 3D printing and laser cutting, you can iterate very mm -hmm. quickly. Uh, cooking probably takes a little longer, but with something like that where each individual cookie is different, you can like optimize, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So, how, how were you able to prototype and test the cookie making machine without and still stay nice and trim. It seems like uh, <laughs> I, I, if I would do that, I would like well, walk away 30 yeah. pounds heavier. I, I've eaten a fair bit of raw cookie dough, but I've actually never cooked anything out of it because I only finished the project on Friday night. And so it was like, you know, basically right okay. in there. And so it's, uh, <laughs> okay, cool. Does it, uh, so does anybody have any questions for Ben? Okay, hang on. You mean the microscope? What's that? The microscope. The electron the microscope? Yeah. I think I do actually have some photos of it. 
There it is. So I brought this to Maker Faire last year and the year before, and this is uh, my scanning electron microscope. And uh, how much does it weigh? Um, maybe 300 pounds or something in that range. What, what's 